I'd like to welcome everybody to today's webinar, which is a deep dive into the MIPS regulation. My name is Scott Mash, and as always, I'm joined by my good friend and partner in crime, Ms. Kathy Costello. Now, we, again, there is, you will find one document, which is uh, a single document containing a number of tables, what we've done out of the 23, almost 2,400 pages of the MAC regulation towards the end and maybe spread throughout in a few spots. There's some really important tables that will give you a list of the uh, CPIA activity, details around the quality measures. And again, remember, there's some new measures or specialty measure sets. So that's critical information. Um, you also find uh, um, um, the ACI measures, what was meaningful use. Um, there's, some, there's a table with all of the transition measures for 2017, whether you, go with, you stay with stage two or you go to stage three. Now, as you read through things and you're confused, don't worry. Join the Every, crowd. <laughs> yeah, everybody is. There's a massive amount of detail in those 2,400 pages. We're all learning together, and we all know things are going to change. What we're going to do today is try to provide you with a, a, enough information to get you started for 2017. So thinking way back, how in the world did we get in this mess? You go back to 1965 when Medicare Medicaid was created. 73, you got the HMO Act. And you see as we get closer to the 2000s and in the 2000s, you see a whole lot more activity. What you have in 2003 and 2006, it really provides the basis for quality reporting. IQR and what was PQRI. Those, it was just kind of getting your feet wet, understanding how the measures were pulled, and quite honestly, um, working through some of those measures. Some of them weren't real easy to, real easy to draw, uh, needed some tweaks. In 2008, you see the first interoperability, the first IT-based program, uh, which is ERX. And then we go into meaningful use and value-based uh, purchasing uh, through where we are today with MACRA and MU Stage 3. So what we have today is an alphabet soup of payment reform. Um, huge shift towards uh, quality-focused uh, payment systems. Most of these programs have a chronic care management com uh, component. Really, if you embrace the concepts of a, a patient-centered medical home and the a chronic care management, transitional care management, you're going to be successful in any program that you do. Uh, another thing you really need to do with any of these programs is risk stratify your patients and focus on the most sick. Don't forget, you know, that your healthy population, keep them healthy, but keep the sick folks out of the hospital. So what we're going to do real quick here is look at the rewards and penalties for MIPS and APM, really the macro program. Now, we are going to be talking about 2017 today, and the reason 2017 is important is on this chart you see 2019. The 2017 performance year will uh, mark your, your reward or penalty in 2019. You got a 4% up and down swing in 2019. The best of the best will receive up to 14%. If you're in an APM, you're going to get a 5% bump. And you see there's some, it, it has a growing penalty and uh, uh, upward adjustment up to 2025. Keep in mind, that this is a budget neutral program. MACRA is budget neutral. For it to remain budget neutral, there's got to be losers so there can be winners, which is why the program is difficult. So uh, we got missing a slide here. Um, sorry, folks. Missing the. Yeah, we've got a few things mixed around. Anyway, we're going to talk a lot about the composite performance score today. And what the composite comp ugh, composite performance score is, is really the four pillars of MACRA. It's quality, it's a meaningful use, which is now called ACI, quality reporting, rep resource use or cost, and cl clinical practice improvement. The reason you should care is if you get a score, you get a CPS score of 70 or better, then you as a physician, or if you report under a group, you are eligible for that exceptional performance adjustment up to 14%. And we say exceptional because, or I'm sorry, you're eligible for it because behind the scenes, there's going to be some, you know, they're going to make sure that 
the folks who get 14% are in fact the best of the best. Uh, as we talk through things and you think about the four pillars, ACI, quality reporting, resource use, and CPIE, a lot of folks will say, oh my gosh, the sky is falling, this is too much, we can't do it. Really what MACRA does is it pulls together meaningful use, PQRS, and what your quality and process improvement teams are probably already doing into one payment program. And honestly, there's less meaningful use measures, there's less quality measures. If you pull everything together, think of it as a conglomerate, it's actually an easier program. Now, if you are in an FQHC or an RHC, you're not subject to MIPS for those billings done under those programs. Now, you know, there's always those services that you provide that are outside that you build traditional fee for service. Those are eligible under the MIPS program. So if you have, uh, if you have so many of those billings outside of FQHCs and RHCs that would push you above the um, threshold, uh, the exclusion threshold, then you would, you would have to report under MIPS. If method two billings uh, for those C providers working at a critical access hospital, you are subject to MIPS. You must report under MIPS. Locum tenums, they really aren't subject to MIPS, um, but keep in mind that those locum tenums are working as the provider that they're replacing. So the work that the locum tenums is doing may well, will directly impact the provider that they're working for. So make sure that your locum tenums are meeting your quality uh, thresholds, that they're working within your, your EHR, that they're doing everything that they, in fact, should be doing. Now, if you think back to meaningful use, hospital providers were on the outside looking in, not true under MIPS. Hospital providers are subject to MIPS, but are not required to report to the ACI or meaningful use. The calculation is a little bit different. It's a 75% threshold uh, for a place of service 21, 22, and 23. Uh, 22 is in addition to what we saw under meaningful use. Uh, they're going to look at a one-year period. They, being CMS, will look at a one-year period to, to deem a, a provider hospital-based. Um, and again, the ACI is going to drop to a it's going to be reweighted to zero, but those hospital-based providers are required to report quality and CPIA activity. Yeah, it's important that you note what the difference is here between what you are doing with meaningful use and what you're going to be doing under MIPS with these hospital-based providers. Um, and you'll see this all the way through as we go through each measure. There's different ways that they can be handled, but under meaningful use, anyone who is billing greater than 90% as a place of service 21 or 23. So in the ED or the inpatient setting, um, those were deemed hospital providers, whether or not they were um, ones who handled, you know, infection, whether they were hospitalists, uh, whether they were radiologists, whatever. Those were hospital providers. Now as you move into this MIPS area, you pick up the outpatient billing of a place of service 22, and the percentage drops to 75% or above. And, and the reason that's significant is because before you used to exclude out these hospital-based providers, they, were, they weren't eligible for meaningful use measures or incentives. But now these fellows and these, these uh, women will be eligible to participate but it's just that if they fall into this definition of hospital-based, you won't have to search for meaningful use measures to have them meet or know what system to work in if you're in the hospital system or the ambulatory EHR system. In this case, they drop to zero under their meaningful use measures or ACI, and then they get graded on the other three measures, assuming they're not reporting as a group anyway. Yeah, and we would also like you to keep in mind that reweighting a one of the pillars to zero is different than getting a zero, zero score. Because <laughs> if, if they reweight one category to zero, then they reweight the remaining scored categories. If you get a zero, then yeah. you got a it's like getting an F on a test. Yeah, <laughs> it's, think about it like if you were the SAT and you, they decided not to score one of the sections because it was a uh, it was a test or uh, you know um, practice, and so they they scored the other three, and you could still score 100% on the other three. 
as opposed to if you got every question wrong in that section, then you start at 75% as your maximum grade. So it really makes a difference on whether you're re-weighting or whether you're just not reporting. And you have to be careful about this when you're dealing with your providers and thinking about what you want to do next year. Uh, one recommendation we do have for future years, we, there may come a time where hospital-based providers are no longer have their ACI re-weighted to zero. So talk to your hospital EHR vendors now and say, hey, what are we going to do in the future so that we can get provider-specific reports out of our hospital, hospital system like you see out of your ambulatory EHR? Now, your non-patient-facing providers, they're also included. Um, it's your radiologists, your path anesthesiologists, pathologists. They, these are ones that traditionally don't see a whole lot of uh, have patient encounters bill. Yeah, and the, and the way they're going to categorize those patients, or I'm sorry, those providers, is if they have less than 100 patient-facing encounters. Now, there is two time periods that CMS is going to look at, and they're noted here on, on bullet point two. And if in either one of these time periods, a provider is below the threshold and can be deemed non-patient facing, then they're good. Either one. If they are over on both, then, um, then they're not patient facing. So, and again, they're going to do an adjustment. Your meaningful use is going to drop to zero. Uh, ACI is going to drop to zero, and then they reweight quality and CPIA. And there may be some craziness in the uh, the uh, quality measures that you have to select for those providers. Yeah, as well. and we'll talk about that when we get to the quality area because that's one of the big differences um, with the MIPS reporting. So, also for your specialists that are in fact patient uh, facing. Um, they may or may not be subject to the ACI or meaningful use because you're going to have a few of those providers that for whatever reason are outside of the meaningful use program. Where things get crazy is with quality. We're going to go into those details here in a little bit, so we're not going to talk about them in depth now. All right, so now again, we're, we're going to talk in 2017. Um, for your reporting options for MIPS, we're talking to eligible clinicians. Remember, our terminology is a little different here. You have four options for your reporting in 2017. Option one, which we don't see a lot of people, or we hope we don't see a lot of people using, is absolute minimal reporting. And you're doing this to avoid penalties. You're not going to get an, up, an uptick in your, your uh, um, um, fee for service for this. This is a period less than 90 days where you submit one clinical quality measure, one CPIA, and some of the base measures. And again, that's less than 90 days. Option two is 90 days, at least 90 day reporting. And it's a little bit more, uh, you know, it's one quality measure, one CPIA, and then all of the base measures for the meaningful use or ACI. Where we hope to see most people is option three. And really, if you've ever done meaningful use in PQRS and you've been successful, you should be in option three. With option three, you can get the incentive. Of course, you're always subject to penalty, but you can definitely get the, the incentive here as well. Um, and under this, you've got to report all of the base requirements, your sick quality measures, your CPIA activities up to 40 points, and your meaningful use or ACI. The other option you have is if you're actually participating in an advanced APM, then you're good to go there as well. So how do you find out if you must report? Well, first off, half of the providers are not going to be required to report. They're going to meet some exclusion. But in 2017, it's your, it's your uh, MDs, DOs, and your mid-levels, Kyra, th that whole list there that you see. All the other licensed professionals are exempt under MIPS. They may be subject under an APM. But in future years, they're going to add PTOT and, and other, other providers of care. First. For all of your providers, if, if they are with, have one of those credentials mentioned on, on bullet point one, then look at the low volume threshold. It's if you bill less than 30,000 or you see one, less than 100 unique uh, Medicare uh, Part B patients, then you're, you're, then you're out. You're, you're, you yeah. are excluded from the program. And CMS is supposed to let you know before the start of the reporting period who's in and who's out. Um, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Um, if you're a new Medicare provider, you're brand new to billing, you just got out of your residency, you, you are excluded as well. 
And if you're a QP or partial QP, which means you're, you're participating in a, an advanced payment model, then you are uh, excluded from MIPS reporting as well. There's one or two little caveats there that we'll talk about later. But again, when you're trying to determine who, you know, if you as a provider or who in your, organi your organization is eligible, first look at your exclusions. Are they a new provider? Are they below low threshold? Are they in an APM? Once you, if by that time you've not excluded them, start putting together your reports and then start thinking about how you're going to report. And we're going to talk about the options that you're going to have. You have some new options. Uh, with, we, Kathy and I are strong believers in data registries. We'll talk more about that later. And I apologize if we went very fast, but we want to we want to save some time for the meat of the program. With that, I'm turning it over to Kathy. Yes, thanks, Scott. Um, we're now getting into the deep dive portion for those of you who had heard the overview before, but we thought it was really important that you understand, again, the question of sorting and, and who you have to report for. Now, when you get into the quality reporting for 2017, and we're talking generally MIPS eligible uh, professionals or eligible clinicians, they are going to be weighted for quality reporting 60% of their total composite performance score. So this is really where the meat of the matter is. Because as you can see, your meaningful use or advancing care information is worth 25%. Nothing for the cost uh, reporting category, and then 15% for this new uh, clinical improvement area. So you really want to spend your, ten, your time on quality reporting. And the, the quality metrics look a little bit different on APMs, but we'll look at that tomorrow when we do the APM deep dive. Um, just to give you a little background about quality reporting, when we began with uh, PQRS in 2007 with 74 measures, um, today there are over 255 measures. And the, our uh, society, specialty society measures bring that up to over 900 measures totally can be reported for quality. So if you don't have a strategy on quality, join the ranks because it's been uh, fairly loose way of doing quality and people were mainly just looking for measures that they thought they could report. I think it's important as you go into 2017 that you develop more of a strategy for reporting. And that includes looking at vendors and registries, um, of which there are over 150 now. Um, and up until 2017, so this year is the last year under PQRS, you did need to report nine measures for your providers on Medicare Part B patients. And you will not have to worry about that anymore because you go into a totally new reporting system under MIPS. Now, just to look at quality and why sometimes it is very difficult to draw together your quality metrics. Because I think a lot of people who are now still going to be working on MIPS may have come from the meaningful use area where the quality measures were reported basically as just attestations of what was in the EHR system. But when you're looking at MIPS, you absolutely need to be thinking in a broader sense as to what quality is and how you draw it. Quality does not come just from one source in the EHR. It can be drawn from your billing system, from your lab system, from your EHR, um, from any one of a number of places. And so you, you have to have a good understanding of what's underneath each quality measure. Every quality measure is drawn as a, a combination of information that includes demographics, the problem list, the allergies, vitals, meds, labs and procedures. Pretty much the old meaningful use state right, one right. measure. Right, right. And that's, and that's why they had them there. They wanted you to start entering that data. Yes, because they wanted you to understand when we had 25 different meaningful use measures, what they were really trying to get you to do is to enter things that then would populate the quality metrics and give a more precise picture of how that provider was handling their patient base. Um, we have just I think two examples here 
just to show you what we're saying about how it can be difficult to get your arms around quality if you haven't worked in this area before. This is uh, a measure, the very common one for colorectal cancer screening, which is, is run uh, by both CMS for the PQRS program and is part of several of the ACO and alternative payment models. And in this one, you basically are trying to get a higher percentage is a better result. But if you look at this slide, look at all those encounter types that are, go factor into the denominator. So you have to understand which patient encounters are going to trigger the capture of that quality metric. The other thing that's important in this example, and the reason we put it up for you, is this is not a one and done type of measure. This is one of those measures where you need to understand how it draws because it can draw, in this case, from three different sources. In this one, you have your occult blood test, sigma endoscopy, and colonoscopy can all go into drawing this measure and can go back as long as far as nine years to get that numerator figure. And I think it's important to note for this measure and for many others, it does not matter where the data came from. Right. It can come from any source. And that's why interoperability is so important to, to improve your quality scores. You gotta make sure your EHR has the ability to accept data from other sources and get it populated discreetly within your EHR. Or if you don't have it there, uh, you know, learn to go out and ask for it from another provider, like an, uh, an eye exam. Could, a local optometrist or ophthalmologist can certainly help you out with that information if they, in fact, have done that testing. Now, here's one of the most common measures that creates the most problems. And this is uh, diabetes A1Cs. And you would think that it would just be clear as mud as to what you're reporting <laughs> because it's the lower the better. How many of my patients are out of control who have diabetes whose A1Cs are out of control? And so you want as few as possible in your numerator. Well, look at all the ICD-10 codes that populate the denominator here. So you're starting already at a handicap because if you aren't tracking for it, you're going to have a lot of patients who fall into uh, the denominator who should be in the numerator also. Yeah, I think it's also important to note that you really need to spend the time to ensure that everything is mapped cor correctly, that the CQM is built per the specification. And what's interesting about this one, and, and the reason we put it up, because we want you to start paying attention to this with your quality metrics. In this one, you can fall, have a patient fall into the numerator in one of two ways. One is that they are truly out of control, that their A1C is greater than 9. Not a good picture clinically. Um, but the more common way, actually, that we see when we, when we work with people who have a very poor result in this quality metrics is usually in the second category, and that is that the A1C was not tracked during the reporting period. So if you have zero A1C results from the beginning of January to now, then that is going to show up as that patient out of control. So again, if you can find a way to get that A1C documented, the chances are that your results are going to be better. This is one of those um, results that could well be stored and come from the lab uh, feed. So you, you want to be aware of where it comes from and then what the exclusions are, in this case, gestational diabetes. Okay, now, Ted, go back to that list that Scott gave you at the very beginning, and I think when you get the handouts, Kathy Rich will send them all to you, um, they'll all be in separate buckets. But if you look at the one that is the major um, quality metric uh, kind of whole packet of the information on each individual quality metric, you'll see that there's a lot of lot there. There's, as I said, over 250 measures. But I want you to be able to understand how to read this because it's so important that the quality process be well understood 
when you're planning your MIPS strategy for next year. If you start on the left-hand side of the column, uh, columns here, there are these symbols uh, that this is something new to the quality reporting. But what that's telling you is what you need to know about this measure, because these are important signs for you. The first one, the asterisk, is, means that there has been a significant change in how that measure is captured from last year. Obviously, if it's a measure that you're used to working with, you're going to want to know that to make sure that you can change your workflow and educate your providers. And that, possibly modify your EHR. As right, well. right. And yes, make sure that it's drawing correctly in the EHR so you can talk to your vendor if it's an issue. The second uh, symbol is a plus sign, and this means that this is a new measure. The significance of that's twofold. First of all, it gives you the opportunity to look at a, a measure that possibly may fit your practice well, especially if you're in a specialty area that does not have a lot of measures that it will be accommodated. So check and see what that is. The second advantage about new measures is they have no benchmarks. If they're brand new, there are no benchmarks. So you are not going to get a minus um, quality um, measurement for reporting that. You can only get a positive for reporting. And so you, you want to make sure that you at least consider those when you're, you're drawing your list of six quality measures to report. The third area, and this to me is a very, very important one. It's a kind of that section symbol, a double S, is these are called core quality measure collaborative measures. And so CQMC, very important for uh, an underlying reason. Those of you who have had to work the past few years in trying to align your quality metrics across numerous payers, what you find is that the payers have very little uh, agreement about how these measures should be pulled. And so even th though they may call it the same measure, it may vary by uh, 10 years as to the, the patient base that's being uh, drawn, or it may vary by, um, you know, how it's reported or, you know, other things, enough to make it difficult to track and use the same measure. This group, the Core Quality Measure Collaborative, is actually a group that was uh, founded between CMS and AHIP, which is American health insurance plans. And so basically it's the Payers Trade Association. And they've been working for two years with CMS to arrive at common metrics for some of the more common um, quality me measures that are needed by everybody. And so what this is the first year you, that you see these actually introduced by CMS. And these are agreed upon metrics. There are 17 measures that go to some of the most common measures that you would use. It's the A1Cs, a number of the cardiology measures, a number of the preventive uh, breast cancer, colorectal cancer screening, um, BMI, tobacco use, uh, high blood pressure control, uh, diabetes, a number of the diabetes, eye exam, foot exam type of thing. So if you normally draw a common, uh, you, what I consider a common measure, look at those and see which ones of those might be ones that you can use because you may be able to use it as the payers start knocking on your door wanting you to send them quality measure too. The next two symbols, the um, Exclamation point and the double exclamation point are ones that mean that they're high priority or high priority and appropriate use. And as you know, everyone is going to have to report at least one outcome measure. If you don't have an outcome measure you can report on, then you report on a high priority measure. So you want to be aware of how to read these tables. I, I think these are really good tables. I was quite impressed with them. And they actually um, have two sets of tables. One goes to the overall measures and one goes to the specialty measures. And the specialty and subspecialty, I think we may have, uh, let me 
just check. I was going to say I was looking to see. Oh, no, it's on this slide. Okay. Um, the let, Let's lay out what you need to report on first, and then we'll talk about the specialty measures. Every provider this year, in 2016, you're reporting on nine measures, if you have them. Starting in 2017, you'll report on six measures. You will not have to go into that crazy, does it cover three domains? Yeah. You, no domains, no domains. You just pick the measures that fit your practice. No requirement for cross-cutting this year. There is a requirement, as I said, for one outcome or high-priority measure. Um, the other thing to notice, and this is important for smaller groups who may have used this, there are no measures groups. And what these were were uh, situations where it might have gone to diabetes, might have gone to um, orthopedic surgery, you know, there's rheumatology. There are very specific measure groups that usually had from five to eight measures attached to it. And th rather than having to report directly out of your EHR, you could get information for 20 of your patients and basically do a chart abstraction for those 20 and then report those measures and you were done with your reporting for that provider. So it was very simple, very clean, gave you the chance to pick your own measures. And CMS is not going to do that. That, that method is re being retired after 2016. What CMS is going to be asking is that you report on all your, your payers, um, and you need to report on 50% of all your patients, regardless of the payer, rather than just stick with your Medicare Part B patient. So this is a big, big change in how CMS is asking you to report. And since there will no longer be measures groups, people who use measures groups really need to think about um, how they want to report. And if they use measures groups, they were used to working with a registry because that was a registry uh, method. Um, but you may want to talk to your registry again about how to report for 2017. Let's talk about the specialist and subspecialist list. As, as I said, you'll receive the attachment with all the, all the measures generally listed and then a second um, stack of measures that are done by specialty or subspecialty. And I thought, again, this was uh, a real improvement over the way that CMS had organized the measures in the past. Because what you see now are measures that go to very specific um, specialists in the, in the medical field. And you would have, for example, family practice, which you can imagine has dozens of measures all the way through electrophysiology that I think has maybe three mm, measures. Yeah. But the interesting thing is they have measure specialist measures that I have never noticed before. For example, they have a measures uh, that goes to the hospitalist specialist. And you wouldn't think that you never really worried about what you reported for hospitalists before. But this now has measures that you can track for. And so I would suggest that you look at those measures groups. If, you're in, uh, if you work in a practice that is a very small or a very specialized practice that does not have six measures to report on, then go to that uh, specialty measures um, list and see if you can find your specialty. If you can find it and it has less than six measures, as long as you report on all the measures in that group, three or four or whatever listed, you will satisfy your requirement for quality measures reporting. And please note, the last thing I'd say about this, um, well, two, two things is the CAPS Patient Satisfaction Survey was being used last year to meet three different um, measure, quality measures reporting. So, so three out of your nine, if you did a CAP survey, would cover you. And that is no longer true. If you do a CAP survey, this is starting in 2017, you only get credit for one quality measure reporting. The last thing I'd say about um, how you select measures, if you report as a group, then you want to pick six measures that cover the most a number of providers. 
But no, when you report as a group, it's kind of like the GPRO was last year and the year before. You do not have to have a measure that meets every single provider in that group. So let's say you have a multi-specialty group that has a lot of primary care, but also has cardiology and orthopedics and rheumatology as part of it. And you pick six measures, and they're primarily primary care. And you're like, well, what about these other ones? Well, as long as you're reporting as a group, it will cover all your providers regardless of what their specialty is. But the other thing I'd say about this, and um, I, I think it's, it's worth noting, is that if you do have a group like this, first of all, you want to follow more than just the six you're going to report on. You know, I would, I would recommend, I think that oh, we've told least. people to usually track at least double what you yep. need to report on because you'd be surprised at how well you might do. And if you're in a multi-specialty group and you say, do have, say, cardiology, it may be that a couple of the cardiology measures may look really good to you, even though they don't apply to the majority of your providers. If It may be that you only have three cardiologists but you have a smaller patient base there. Say you only have 100 patients that are in the cardiology practice, but you have very high-performing cardiologists. It may be that you want to report those measures, and they will cover all your providers in that group, even if they do not see uh, cardiology patients. And this is where strategy comes in. Strategy, strategy. Okay, 12 measures. Pick three that you probably normally wouldn't pick based on a specialty. If you have, high, like Kathy said, you have a high-performing small group of subspecialists, track one or two of those measures in the 12 that you're going to track. Right. Okay, and just, just a reminder, as I said, 50% of all patients in 2017 need to be reported, and in 2018 that rises to 60%. And the reason this is coming about is CMS is trying to create an all-payer database. There was a lot of pushback in the ranks to, for them, about them doing this, but they decided to plow ahead. And so this is why you are going to be reporting for all your patients, or 50% this year. And there is, as Scott said, there is so much strategy around doing a successful reporting um, for quality measures, you really need to be familiar with what it is you're supposed to be doing. Okay, now when you're submitting quality, here are all the various ways that you can do it, and not just the quality. Let's say your meaningful use, which is what's called ACI, and then your clinical practice improvement, CPIA. And people are asking, they're confused about how to get this stuff reported. Right now, most providers that we know were attesting to meaningful use. So they were going in and putting the numerator and denominator, and they were then pushing the PQRS quality measures through a registry or through their EHR vendor. Uh, you know, there were different ways, or they were doing CMS web portal. And any of those were fine. Well, in 2017, you're still going to have those options, but what you're going to see is that there's almost a blending of what people can do because it is you are no longer limited um, by to report through attestation uh, directly to CMS. You can actually do attestation um, and do your meaningful use ACI reporting and your clinical practice improvement can be done through attestation. And what I, I'd suggest is consider your comfort level on how you want to report. If you're good with reporting through attestation, especially if you're just doing a group reporting, um, you're going to have a very quick process. The CPIA, the Clinical Practice Improvement, is merely a yes-no question. So it is not difficult, no matter how you report, to do that uh, with for any any form because it, you're just basically going to be answering one yes no question so let's review from the top you can do your quality reporting through claims the cost is done through claims but cms calculates it and you don't need to worry about that 
You can do your quality through registry reporting, as we talked about. And the registries also, starting in 2017, can take your meaningful use ACI information and your clinical practice improvement. Your EHR uh, directly or through your vendor um, is going to be quality, meaningful use, and clinical practice improvement. And Qualified Clinical Data Registries, QCDRs, these are the Specialty Society Quality Registries. And these are actually good ones to investigate if you have a lot of specialists um, and see if you want to report the not only through their quality metrics and uh, CMS metrics, or you can do quality with uh, ACI and CPIA can all push through them now. So the idea is to find a way that's easy for you to report. If you're doing group reporting, you can push everything to, through one particular source or one particular way of reporting. Now, technically, you can report your ACI one way, your quality another, and your CPI. Right. You can way. do Don't whatever do you want. <laughs> whatever you want. You can do three different ways of reporting. And you can also do the CMS web interface if that's one th way that you've been doing your quality reporting. Now, if it seems like we don't have a lot of information around the specifics, that's because it doesn't exist yet. Yeah, CMS has not given us a lot of uh, details, and the registries are supposed to let us know when they get the um, actual logic to be able to load this information so they can tell you what to do. Um, it is really your right to decide how you want to report. And just note, if you are doing group reporting, you do not need to pre-register unless you're doing CAPS reporting or unless you're using the CMS web interface. Um, the rules, we won't go into a lot on the, the data registries because I think we're going to do a webinar with one of the data registries and once we, we get all the information about how they're going to report. But let me just say that the rules have really stepped up um, the involvement of the data registry, so it is worthwhile. CMS will be putting out a list between now and the end of the year of all the data registries that are acceptable for CMS reporting um, and what measures they can report on, whether it's just the quality, whether they can do the quality, the ACI, and the CPIA. So wait and see that what that looks like, and then you can contact them and see what the cost is and if it fits in with your plans on reporting. As I said earlier, Kathy and I are big believers in the data registries, and the reason, is, the reason why is many of the registries have logic built in to report on your best patients. And, and when I say best patients, remember, you're reporting, you have to report on at least 50% of your patients. That means there's 50% of your patients you don't have to report on. Yeah. And the logic in those systems will find the best picture of yourself, the best picture of the organization, find the best 50%, and then submit that data. Yeah, and, and they'll pull from all your different sources, from your billing, your lab, your EHR, to find every piece of information that will support your, your submission. And if you have multiple EHRs, it's the way to go. Yeah, no okay. kidding. Okay, so I'm going to turn it back over to Scott to talk a little bit about the technology. And this is the um, ACI, which is basically the old meaningful use. So meaningful use really did provide the groundwork for, for many of the uh, payment reform programs and MACRA. Um, this is important. It is 25% of your overall score. So if you do not meet ACI, the base requirements, the best you can do is a C. Um, so we're going to just jump right in and talk about a couple different things. First, we want you to understand that under, under MIPS, under Medicare, you're, you, we use the term eligible clinicians. You are going to be reporting for providers under Medicare that you used to do under Medicaid. Medicaid takes its own track. So back, back to the, the Medicare eligible clinicians, you need at least 90 days. Um, you, you can do stage two or you can go to stage three. We're going to talk a little bit more about those measures. Um, and you will include physicians in your Medicare attestation that still haven't cashed out and that will still attest under the Medicaid program. Right. Think about the MIPS program as being a payment program 
for providers who bill Medicare Part B. If they bill Medicare Part B, it doesn't matter what else you're doing with them, if they are doing meaningful use under Medicaid or not, you want to include them because otherwise they'll be penalized for not reporting. If you still have uh, years of attestation or years of incentives under the Medicaid program, that is going to stay traditional. It's what we think of meaningful use today. You know, continue to attest to Medicaid as well. Hospitals, you're heading down your own track as well. You're going to see in 2017 a 90-day reporting period. You can do stage two or stage three. CPOE and CDS go away for the hospitals. All right, let's talk about real quick in 2017 under MIPS stage two. Um, your minimum thresholds go away. Exclusions really go away. You want to get, you got to get at least one patient and those that are marked required for base score. So you need to do your private, yeah. privacy and security review regardless. Yeah, and you've got to get one patient, at least one patient in the numerator for ERX, for your patient access, and for your transition to care summary sent. But you don't want to go there. You don't want just one patient. What they do to calculate your overall score, you're going to get 100%. You, you can get up to 100% by adding together all of your scores, doing some, some crazy math, um, you get uh, up to 10%, well, you get 10% for the yes, no on, on your immunization reporting. Syndromic specialized registry are no longer required, but you do get a bonus. Um, if you report uh, to a public health registry over and above immunization, you get 5% bonus. And there, we're gonna talk about some improvement activities that also cross over that are gonna give you 10%. But again, no exclusions. You cannot be excluded from that transition of care mesh, you measure. You can get zero percent on anything that's not a required base score yep. and still report, but the goal is to try to get as high a grade as you can. Just make sure that you have at least one patient in each one of those base areas um, so that you aren't rejected for not having met one of the base patients. Now, if you're going to go for stage three in 2017, Here's a list of your measures. Those that say required for base score in red in that middle column are the ones that you have to get at least one patient. You've got to get a one in all of those or answer yes to that associated question. If not, you get a zero, not a reweighting. You get a flat zero. And again, there's bonuses. Honestly, what I would do is I would set goal thresholds for the organization to ensure that you get 100% meaningful use. This is old hat, it's nothing new, you yeah. can do it. So what your, what your required areas are e-prescribing, uh, as we said, privacy and security, your patient portal, your electronic uh, summary of care sent for referrals, and the new one as part of stage three, as part of the base, is the request or accept patient record. And there are different ways that you can do this. You can pull in information that you get through direct uh, email. You can pull in information from the um, HIE, which will flow right into your record, and this will all count. So if you are going to go for Stage 3 in 2017, my advice would be to track your Stage 2 measures up to when you go live with your Stage 3 version. But again, you can go either way, Stage 2 or Stage 3. Now, there are some clinical, improvement, clinical practice improvement activities that if you do, give you a bonus, will increase your score yeah, under up, the ACI. Up to 10 percent. So yeah. it's really worth looking at these and this whole um, combination between clinical practice improvement and your meaningful use or ACI is so valuable. Yeah, you know, take some time in looking through that list because there, I think there's a lot on here that you could be doing that would help you in your meaningful use score. Right, and you see, uh, as you, many of you know, your CPOE and CDO, C, CDS requirement go away for scoring, but what do we see here in the list of ACI, or CPIA activities? Right, if you, CDS. If you, so. if you use clinical decision support, which all of you are set up to do because there's a reportable area under meaningful use, you can get credit for that. But what, I, what I'd say is, um, and we'll talk about it in a minute as we move into clinical practice improvement, the, the one uh, chart that we sent you, actually it's a number of pages, they're like over 50 
areas in CPIA, in CPIA, you want to look at it and see what the underlying requirements are because some of them are multi-part and some are only one thing. And a lot of the CPIA activities are going to be functions that are over and above the standard certified technology. They're new modules or it's at least a new way of using those certified modules. Yeah, or you even using the HIE for transitions of there care, or monitoring yep. that. Using uh, those QCDR registries in certain instances will count. Um, using enhanced patient portal. I mean, there's all kinds of things that you're already working on, but look at the details. Let's get specific about how you can get credit for this. And, and again, this is where I go back to where, you know, a lot of people are, think the sky is falling, but it's not. There, there are ways to be very successful in this program doing nothing more than you're doing today. And again, that's assuming you're doing meaningful use in PQRS. Okay, so a little bit deeper dive on the clinical practice improvement, the CPIA area. As we said, this is the lowest weighted of the three areas that you will report on, you're, uh, and that is 15%, assuming you're not in the APM, you will get 15% of your total score goes into this area in 2017. And you have the advantage of being our second set of uh, second presentation, and so we actually went back and researched this area because we had been asked a question about it. Because uh, the rules say basically that if one, if you're reporting as a group, and even one member of the group is doing one CPA IA activity for at least three months in 2017 that you can get credit for the whole group. And that was the one that people were sitting up going, what, what'd you say? So we went back and got the actual language right out of the reg when it says, we'd like to explain that all MIPS eligible clinicians reporting as a group will receive the same score for the improvement activities performance category. If at least one clinician within the group is performing the activity for a continuous 90 days in the performance period, the group may report on that activity. That is strictly for 2017. Trust me, they are trying to get people to participate in this. It's um, a way of making it easy. I'm sure next year in 2018, they're going to be looking at more broad uh, scale um, adoption of CPIA activity, but it just recognize how easy that will be if you're reporting for a group. You must have at least 40 points of clinical practice improvement to report in this area. Um, understand that the individual measures are weighted either at 10 or 20 points. So it isn't a lot that you need to report on. And partial satisfaction, if you look at the measure and you have only done part of the things that are listed, it's not going to count. You absolutely need to have all of it. And let's look at how that 40 points can be broken out. If you are PCMH site, you automatically get the maximum number of points. You don't have to do another thing on that list if you're PCMH accredited. And that's if one site in your one group. One site is, say you have 12 primary care sites and only one is PCMH uh, accredited, you still will get credit for the group as a whole for your TIN. And again, that's only if you're reporting as a group. Right. That's a specific if, you're, example. if you're reporting individual by individual, then it's where they're located and if that group is PCMH uh, or if their practice site is PCMH. Okay, then the next one is if you are part of an APM, you receive half credit right off the bat if it's a non-MIPS APM. And if you want to know what that is, we'll be covering that in more depth tomorrow. Because there are some APMs that get full credit in this category, but uh, some that only get partial credit. But just recognize that if you're an APM, you need to pay attention here because it, it may be uh, something that you get off quite easily on. Um, if you're a MIPS APM, you do not need to report this separately. If you are in one of these specialized categories, you only need to report basically half the weighting. So if you're a small practice, less than 15 providers, you're a rural practice, 
you're located in the health professional shortage area, HIPSA area, or you're a non-patient facing clinician, rather than having to meet 40 points, you only need 20, which is either one high rated or two medium rated activities. So the, just, the idea is to try to make it easier on these particular groups. There are many, many, many areas to that are covered here. It could be emergency responders, say you're, you're part of some EMT program or something. You're doing integrated behavioral and mental health. This is a huge area of priority for CMS. There are a number of measures on that. If you have a chronic care management program, care which you better have anyway. <laughs> very specific. They have like warfarin, they have diabetes. Yep. I mean, very specific chronic care management and transitional care management. There's um, a lot of expanded pra practice that looks like PCMH. So, you know, please take that list and go through it. We also are sending you a checklist of those measures, not because the checklist has every detail in it, but it's resorted so you can kind of look by category. And then once you look by category, you can go back to the original list of CPIA activities and find the one that co uh, corresponds and see if it fits your practice. Now, one thing to keep in mind, as with any yes, no attestation, you should retain documentation should you be selected for an audit, and there will be audits under this program. We have not seen an audit protocol yet, but I, we're big believers in narratives. Put together a nice narrative, keep all of your documentation associated with your CPIA, and once we know exactly what they're looking for, we'll pass that along. Yeah, and this uh, next year, there's going to be a comparison by improvement, which we don't know what it's going to look like yet, but I'm just telling you it's coming. Don't have to worry about anything on costs this year. Um, cost metrics are not going to be a factor for either MIPS eligible professionals or for APM, so not a problem. So with that, why don't we take a few questions and then we'll let you all head on home and see that beautiful moon rise again. Okay. Wow, Kathy, we got a bunch of questions here, my dear. Uh, where do we download the slides? We'll send them to you if you weren't able to download them from within the app. Does the final rule state what the reweighted scores will be? I'm unable to find those percentages. Yeah. Mm. Okay, the reweighted scores. Um, if you don't have it, with some of them we're talking about tomorrow. And I think in one of the slides for this specialist one where it's reweighted to zero, uh, it, you know. I'm looking to see who sent this. Yes, Kristen. Um, we can send that to you. It's very specific as to how they reweight into the remaining two categories. Scanned results were not allowed in PQRS 2016, correct? And eh, depended really on how right. you uh, adjusted. Right. Right. You can't. Right. You couldn't do scanned. You needed to. It's not an attestation. It is submission of data either. Um, at the Category 1 or the Category 3 level. Well, in 2017, but in 2016 under PQRS, you could still do some chart abstraction for the oh, yeah, yeah, for the the, measure groups. Right, for chart abstraction, right. Where can we find the specialist measure set? We're going to send them to you. It's one of the many yeah. documents we'll That's, be sending you've out. Got a, you're going to have a ton of documents from us, and one of them is the specialist measure set. Is the eligibility requirement for the quality payment program that you have to see at least one Medicare Part B patient. No, if the eligibility, this is such an important difference from where we were with meaningful use. Um, if you receive less than 100 patients, that provider is automatically excluded. You don't do anything else. You can't opt in if you wanted to. You are out, out, out. So if they have less than 100 patients or less than $30,000 in billing in the preceding year, and there's eligibility periods on one of the slides, then that provider is opted out. You don't need even to worry about it. And again, CMS is supposed to make that information available. Available well, in advance. We'll yeah. see. We'll, we'll see. see. Our, we our, our guess is it's going to be a website. You put a, a, an MPI in. Right. If you only have 90 cardio patients in an internal medicine group of 2,000 patients, you have to report on 50% of all patients. If you report as a group practice, then even if the cardio numbers look good, will the denominator be too small? Aren't those cardiologists excluded because they don't meet the threshold? Well, it's it's 50. You if have to report on 50% of the measure of the patients 
who fall into that measure. So that the, the conditions for, a, for one of the quality measures may only let a very small number of patients in. You know, let's say it's a, yeah. it's a I don't know, knee replacement. You're only going to see those patients who have those conditions, have had those type of encounters to be included in the denominator, which could be very, very small. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you're looking, if you're talking about group measure, that's different than if you're talking about individual measure. For 2016, CQM reported, we elected to do PQRS reporting as a group. Recently, we discovered that QCDR we used last year as EPs is only QRDA XML. Do you have suggestions on how to submit data for MU since it doesn't sound like our PQRS data will be seen by CMS? Um, if you are doing... You know, send us an email because it sounds like you've got an issue about how you're reporting and you can report through uh, a data registry and have um, category three um, aggregate data and still have it meet your measure. But, it, you know, the key is to attest to report somehow, even right. if it's differently than you It said. doesn't have to be the same as what you did last year where you did a cat one. But let's, we can, send me an email and we'll, we'll talk about it. If you choose to report as a group, does only one provider have to be PCMH accredited in order for the whole group to get the automatic credit? Yes, ma'am. That's what they that said. That is correct. What are the pros and cons of registry reporting and qualified uh, clinical specialty? Right. There, there's tons of, of pros and cons. Like I said, Kathy and I, really like the registry reporting because some of those registries have really good logic. They take multiple sources of data in different formats and run it through their logic engine and then provide you with the ability to see which measures you like to, you know, you like the best and that you actually want to be submitted, sub yeah, submitted the, to CMS. The specialty registries have the added advantage. Um, a lot of them, if you have providers who are specialty certified, um, that it will usually meet their specialty certification criteria also. And it just depends, too, if you end up reporting specialty metrics. And if you're in a highly specialized uh, group practice, that may be one thing that you want to consider. This is an interesting question. Um, this is for all the math majors out there. What is the best way to create a mock composite score so that your organization can have some sort of starting point for 2017? Oh, okay. Wow. But I would say there, there's a whole strategy to that, meaningful use reporting. And we didn't go into all the detail, but there is a way to, to test it to see where, based upon the percentages that you're currently meeting as far as benchmarks, how those would translate to an ACI. And maybe what we'll do is, is either an article or another, yeah. when we we'll talk about, when we get the that. registry, because there is a way to do that. The, the clinical practice improvement is no biggie. You can get 40 points on that easily. Um, and the quality metrics, there's an, a way of doing that too, but, but the, ACI is, you're going to have to understand how that's converted. Ohio doesn't have syndromic surveillance for 2017, they correct? They do for 2017. If you're stage two, they will go away in 2018. Uh, but if you're stage three, it only it applies is, to right, urgent care providers. Right, and we will do have them on our webinar in January to talk about um, your meaningful use um, public health reporting. If you're in an ACO and you submit your quality data through GPRO, will that satisfy the quality category if you are able to take the APM track? It, it will. There's unusual ways of scoring that, so please listen in the morning um, to our APM presentation. But generally, yes, the answer is yes. It does meet your quality reporting. What is an enhanced patient portal? There are some specific requirements. Yeah, it basically it's, it's kind of a bi-directional where you're using it to push messages to the patient, which everyone's portal has the opportunity of doing, uh, as well as accepting stuff from the patient. But basically that you're using it to do patient reminders and you're using it to query the patient. And so it's not that the functionality is any different, but that you're using it more completely. And you should be able to find those details in the documentation that we've sent. If we have used a registry to report Q PQRS for two years, does it still count as an improvement of practice for CPI? 
for two years. Um, and there's now it has to be done. It has to be done within the calendar year, and it has to be done for three months. And I'm I'm trying to get a handle from CMS as as far as the data registry, what three months means, because obviously no one uses the data registry year round. So I'm going to guess if you do one reporting through the data registry, you'd be okay. But l let me get clarification on that. Yeah, and there are some of the improvement activities that specify that it must be something new that you haven't done before, and others where if it's old yeah, hat, but, you're but going next to year's the first yeah. first year. So yeah, so but they do need to do it within that calendar year. Since we are reporting quality measures in MIPS now, does that mean we do not report to CQMs in meaningful use? That is correct. Starting in 2017, not 2016, in 2017 you will no longer have any type of quality reporting separate from what you're doing for MIPS. Now, I, I was just passed a message that we want to clean up a Thank you guys for attending. If you have any questions or you have follow-up questions, email Kathy and me. 